Stuff Podcasts. Warning, this episode contains strong language and has references to sexual abuse, which some may find upsetting. Listener discretion is advised. My name is Alec Tolia for Panther 33. As Polynesian Panthers, we now had a platform, power to the people. To be in the same uniform, walking in the same direction, it meant you weren't alone anymore. Whenever we went on an activity, everything's in black. If you're able to wear a beret, you wear one or it's just a black jacket. Or jeans, black shirt. But I didn't really like the beret because it didn't fit on my afro, you know? <laughs> They had the meanest afro, a perfect afro. You'd never seen an afro like it. So they couldn't wear a beret. You know how hard it is to find a beret in New Zealand. You had to go to like an army surplus shop or something like that. I did the whole stabang. I loved it. I bought all my clothes from the Cook Street Market. I saw myself as a bit of a fashionista. I didn't wear my sunnies that often, but quite a few of them wore sunnies and even inside. I mean, I used to laugh about it and say, is the sun uh, getting to you around there? <laughs> it's really an empowering thing to see that we're all in the same uniform more or less and we're moving together. What was it all about being a panther? Standing up on behalf of our people. Don't take any shit. Take care of your fellow neighbour and stop this racism. Our families are part of a long line of people born and bred in the small islands of the South Pacific. But in the 1950s, our parents looked for a new life in Aotearoa, making us the first generation of New Zealand-born Pacific Islanders. But later, in the 1970s, when the economy faced challenges, some New Zealanders started to see our presence as a problem. Newspaper headlines claimed we were violent and dangerous. And the government said we took Kiwis jobs. The government wanted us out. Like the Black Panther movement in the United States, we decided to seize the time. It was time to be heard. It was time to mobilise. It was time to fight back. We formed a Polynesian Panther Party. Our aim was to strike at the core of racism and provide a voice for our community. But leading our people to fight for a fair and just society wasn't without sacrifice. This is our history. These are our words. For two years, the Polynesian Panthers found a way to stand up to the racism affecting our Pacific Island community. The more we stood up for basic equal rights, the more the Palangis in charge sought to demonise and control us. In 1973, an oil crisis fueled desperation as energy prices soared. To chart a course through the cross currents of varying points of view and opinion, all must understand the fundamental facts about where our energy comes from, how we use it, and how efficient these uses are. The largest source of energy, oil. 1973 dramatized dependence on foreign oil. The Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries imposed its boycott and within a year raised prices more than 300%. The economy started to tank. The UK looked to join the European common market. New Zealand's trade and colonial ties to Britain were under threat. You reckon it's a sellout from Britain, do you? Yeah, sure, definitely. It's just only one thing they're saying, isn't it? Goodbye, we've helped them out, but they're not interested in us now. It's a finish. Why yeah, don't you yeah. think it's going to turn out well for New Zealand? Do you think that uh, they're I'm... going to be left in the lurch? Of it? Yes, I do. I think we've got to uh, cast our eyes to the to Asia. 
Paul Spoonley. I was a sociologist studying Pacific migrants to Auckland in the 1970s. During the 60s and then in that moment in the early 1970s, there was a realisation that this country was beginning to change, that there were a lot of brown people beginning to appear. To many New Zealanders, it's all a matter of the ties with the old mother country. The archers are on the radio here, Coronation Street's on the television, so any debate in New Zealand about the common market is inevitably also a debate as to whether New Zealand stays in the future as British as she is at present. In the same time, uh, the UK had joined what was then the EEC, so some of those traditional colonial linkages were being broken. Economic disaster will surely arrive, says the Prime Minister, unless New Zealand goes on selling its dairy produce to Britain. Kiwis lost their jobs. They blamed us. Our presence had become a political topic. The streets were hostile and being Pacifica and Aotearoa was more dangerous than ever before. There were three key elements of Pacifica demonisation. One was that they were destroying inner city housing. The second thing was that they were taking our jobs, they were taking New Zealanders' jobs. And the third thing was a law and order issue. You would see it in the media. Pacific Islander rapist, Pacific Islander gang member. It became an association. It's your turn now to make things happen. For your future, the future of all New Zealand. This November, give your vote to Labour. At the end of 1972, Norman Kirk and Labour won the election. They promised to clean up the streets of Auckland. The media said, we were the cause of all inner city crime. And in 1973, the police set up a task force intent on patrolling our neighbourhoods. Roger Fowler, coordinator of the People's Union. They called themselves the task force. They used to go around in a convoy of police vehicles, including these big black vans, which we call Black Mariahs, but they were also known as paddy wagons. They had these big convoys which would visit booze barns, large expanded pubs. A lot of people used to go there you know, after work, especially on a Friday or Saturday night. Tingilo Ness, former Minister of Fine Arts and Associate Minister of Culture for the Polynesian Panthers. The pub back then and into the 60s, 70s when I grew up, you know, and joined the Polynesian Panthers, that was our kind of marae, you know, for all the young ones and the workers that immigrated from the islands. Hard working, hard drinking. They would do the rounds of these booze barns. It was extremely intimidating. You would look up from your beer, policemen with these trench coats and chunches just standing there. They'd pick on people and it was targeting certain sections of the community. They admitted this themselves. There are some cases where we are just targeting uh, areas where Pacific people gather. In most cases, the offenders are Polynesians. But the areas in which we operate are mainly Polynesian areas. What proof have you got, really, that uh, this is racism? They simply don't go to places where wealthy Pākehās, or even not so wealthy Pākehās, uh, congregate, gather, drink, and probably use obscene language. My name is Luther Tullo. I was a police officer. When I was in Auckland, I started as a constable. People were arrested for things these days. A lot of police officers walk straight past them and don't even bother. It's, it's not an issue. Oliver Sutherland, one of the founders of Accord, the Auckland Committee on Racism and Discrimination. If you wanted to get some easy arrests, then you just kept your ears open if you were in the task force and you just grabbed somebody if they, if they swore. Will Ilola here, co-founder of the Polynesian Panther Party. You have this, this situation where a Māori guy comes along, sees a cousin out there and says, Hey, pakarongo mai! He gets done for swearing. Me and Alec would get stopped. I don't have to come with you. 
I know my rights. They are just intimidating and provoking. Um, and then, of course, it'll escalate. Fuck off. All right. <laughs> What's your name? Blah, blah, blah. They, they were taught to observe and see if there's any tick in the eye of somebody, they're guilty. If they start sweating, they're guilty. So intimidate them, get them to make wrong move, and then arrest them. All those trivial crimes, like drunkenness, for instance, which was the majority of the arrests, uh, was bailable. Those people that were arrested were never bailed. The impact on these people's lives, I mean, they spent a night on themselves, they get dragged up before the courts, they get uh, a conviction. The whole stigma that was attached to that for their life afterwards, let alone the feeling, I'm, I'm sure, and I know, the feeling of, of grievance. The police arrested us in the pubs and arrested us on the streets. It was without cause. We were rounded up and thrown into the back of police vans, the meat wagons. It happened like this one night when the Panthers held a social at Auckland University. While that was happening, there was another drama unfolding in, in Albert Park. Al, somebody's been knifed. The street was already crawly with cops. Quite a few people were just chucked in the meat wagon for uh, no obvious offence. I wanted to stop these arrests. I stood up in the, in, the, in the middle of all of this and started calling out badge numbers, asking the crowd to remember the numbers. The cops were visibly annoyed by that and some of them started removing their numbers. Finally, the inspector came up from behind me. Just right then, there was a cop ready to elbow me in the throat. And he just looked at that cop, you know, stop that. And he looked at me and said, who's in charge here? I am. Will you come with me? We're going down to the watch house. And I'm hearing in my mind Will say, make no deals with the cops, no bargains. So I went through the cells that night and I just got the names of everybody and then their phone numbers and contacted their parents and this was going into like the three o'clock in the morning. One of the guys, his family and my family knew each other from the church. So I said to Mara, well, listen, you have to call your dad. I oh, don't no, talk to my dad. I have to talk to your dad. They have to know who you are. You know, where you are, you're underage. Unfortunately, it was not only the adults who were caught by an aggressive police task force. The arrest and detention of a 14-year-old boy highlighted a real failure in the system. There was no duty solicitor scheme in those days. In fact, that was one of the first campaigns we got onto with the Panthers. At the end of 73, there still was no scheme and the government was still dithering about it. And Will Ilalahi got arrested. I was arrested for some Panther stuff I did while I was waiting in the, in the cells there. A 14-year-old schoolboy had just been arrested for being idle and disorderly. He was terrified, mate. I mean, he's a little kid. And here he is, you know, with all, the, all these men. You know, I could see he was shitting bricks. The police asked the kid's father to collect him from central Auckland. But the man had no car and not enough money to pay for a taxi. He turned up at court the next day to discuss his son's bail, but no one ever spoke with him, and the young boy was sent to an adult's prison for a week, then spent three weeks in Owairaka Boys Home. It was an example of how the system failed boys like him, just because he was walking on the street, just because his parents couldn't afford to travel into town. And that's why I got onto Oliver straight away afterwards. I said, hey, look, there's a kid in there. That was really the beginning of a major campaign to stop the remanding of children to adult prisons. No one wanted to be sent to the boys' homes. But too often, young Māori and Pacific kids were. We all heard the stories of sexual abuse and beatings, but what we didn't know was that it put you on a pathway to gangs and eventually prison. Fikitaito, Panther Youth. 
Oh, in Raka Boys Home, yeah, it all depended where you were, if you were insecure, which I was for most of the time. You know, so the boys up the top would have be in dormitories, securing in their bees house, you know, and locked up. But those are the days you had um, things called KPs, which was kingpins, bought by these English housemasters. They picked you as a KP and then made me fight for the entertainment on Sundays or Sunday boxing, they used to call it. Right along the front of Oiraka Ave, through the housemasters' houses, the boys used to clean their yards and do their painting, do whatever. How come they get picked to go inside? They've got the sweet job, they're probably eating. And, but little did I know that that's where all the abuse was happening here. Yeah. The housemaster that was on at night. One of the things that he bought that you know everybody, all the kids used to love was was music. And you know that's what we loved, so we been sing away to it. But then uh, we knew that when it got turned up, we knew they were getting sexually abused. The majority of us that went through boys home together, we all see each other in my kid here. And then from there, Mount Eden, we become men, now we're in Mount Eden, and we see them there, and you know, and we all became gang members of all different gangs. We realised our people were getting caught up in the system, sent to boys homes and then prison, because they didn't know their rights. Police would ask any brown face to show their passport anytime, anywhere. It didn't matter if you were underage or not. There weren't many lawyers around to tell us what to say and what not to say. The Panthers decided to educate our community with a legal aid booklet. By knowing our rights, we could demand to be treated fairly. The Panthers were trying to educate our people was you do not have to talk to the police, but if you do, you're only required to give your name and address. If they ask for more, ask if you've been arrested, and if they say yes, ask them what for. And then once they tell you what you've been charged for, go contact lawyers. So I used to hand them out to everybody on K Road. Wayne Tolio for I was the Minister of Information. The one that helped us to put it together was David Longy. David, of course, went on to New Heights in 1984. Ladies and gentlemen, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, now and for the next three years, the Right Honourable David Longy. But when I met him in the early 70s, you know, he was wearing a a suit that was two times smaller than himself and could barely just do up this and his tie was to one side and thick black rim glasses and lenses, like Joe 90 lenses. One of the nice things about being a lawyer is that you gradually realise the future of this country will depend on the vigour with which people are led and the strength which you enable people to forge around themselves in community links. He was an outstanding guy, you know, he was so intelligent and he had this heart for um, social justice. Psst. You're listening to a podcast from stuff.co.nz. I know you're enjoying it because you've been listening for quite a while. I'm here to tell you about another Stuff podcast you'll enjoy. Stuff to Watch is our weekly guide to the very best new TV shows and movies. It drops every Friday, just in time for your weekend viewing. I'm the host, James Crute, and in just 10 minutes, my expert guests and I will cut through the clutter and find you some stuff to watch. You can find every episode at stuff.co.nz slash stuff to watch. Better still, on Apple and Spotify, you'll find links so you can subscribe, which means you'll get new episodes the moment they're published. So let Stuff to Watch find you... Well, stuff to watch. Thanks for listening.
as you were. The Legal Aid booklet was meant to level the playing field, but sticking our heads above water came at the cost. Panther Chairman Will Irulahia was one of the first to get locked up, defending himself from the aggression we were facing on the streets. There, he saw the inequities in the justice system. I opened up for grievous bodily harm. David Longy told us, never plead guilty. And so I got up and addressed the system and said, how can I get a fair trial when it's written in our uh, legal documents that I've got to be tried by 12 members of my peer group? And this jury here is actually not my peer group. I got six months. When I went into the prison, I got a standing ovation. Probably the first time anybody stood up and said, you know, I'm going to get a peer trial here. Well, I get shipped out because they were trying to shut me up because I was obviously having influence on the prisoners. They send me down to this former miners camp in Ohura. And guess who the, uh, the guys that I'm in prison with? Judges, ex-cops, white-collar crime, and they're going, I'm the only brown guy there. These guys down there on a Friday afternoon, they were able to go to the local RSA, mate. Drinks with the locals at the bar. How come we're not coming? Are you a member of the RSA? That was their answer. That was my final year at uni. So I ended up finishing off my degree inside. It did not matter how hard we fought. It was clear there was one system for us and one for them. As the economy continued to tank and unemployment spiked, the government blamed Pacifica for stealing New Zealanders' jobs. It was clear they wanted to get rid of us. It was not enough to target us on the streets and in the pubs. They now started coming into our homes, workplaces and even our churches. You know, I happened to be coming back from church and I was walking through the car park on the corner of K Road and Ponsonby Road and there was a big number of cops there. They said, uh, I would like to have a word with you. And I said, well, what about? Have you got your passport on you? I said, I don't carry my passport around. Are you looking for overstayers? Those from Samoa and Tonga, and sometimes from Fiji, were not New Zealand citizens. They were allowed to come here for a period, but then as they stayed on, then they breached the regulations under which they'd arrived. The very people that were supposed to be protecting us were the ones we needed protection against. On any day, I'd be thinking about what's likely to happen today. So I would be expecting carloads of people to come by and yell out these racist epithets. I would be expecting that. I would be expecting at some point in my day that I'd become a suspect. But we were already suspects before we even left home. I know my mum was scared. 
I know where she was frightened. I remember her just saying to me, Jagger, wake up. Alelebe. That the immigration were at the door. It was midnight, it was dark, it was late. And we had maybe five or six immigration officers as well as police officers coming on coming into the house. We um woke up, gathered all our belongings and uh immigration came in sort of told us what was going on, told my mum what was going on. I, I fully understood what he said, that we had to pack, that they were, we were being arrested. I was six. The officer that was talking to my mum, telling her we had overstayed our, uh, our permit, kept asking my mum where my dad was, and my dad wasn't there. But they got him at the works that he was, he was working for. My mum and I were, were detained and she was just crying. She was just upset. Malani Anai. I am a Polynesian panther. The first dawn raids took place under a Labour government in 1974. The raids took place at dawn because people were most likely to be home. The idea was to catch people while they were asleep. They would come to a house. They would come in with dogs. They would go right through every room and require people to provide legal evidence of their right to be in New Zealand. Quite a lot of Pacific Island workers couldn't provide the evidence because when they came here, their employers held on to their passports so that they couldn't change jobs. And a lot of people had overstayed their permits with the connivance of their employers because they needed workers. Many employers were upset that their workers were being treated like this. I'm Trevor Richards, chairperson of Heart. Heart was the whole for racist tours movement. Dawn raids were what was the response to handle an economic problem that the Pacific Island community had absolutely no part in making. The constables were, were at the bottom of the food chain and um, we followed what we were told. We were simply told this is what we are doing tonight. We are assisting immigration. It was a house and, and there were the Tongan families in there. The one guy I was dealing with thought that I was Tongan. And it was uncomfortable for me to say not only that I, I am not Tongan, but I can't help you in the way that you are asking me to do. To my knowledge, that young man was taken away and that was the last I saw. I'm Joris de Bress. I was the Secretary of Care, the Citizens Association for Racial Equality. The Pacific community was terrified. People were afraid to, uh, to show themselves. Morning by morning there were, there were more, and they were just taken away in the police vans to the police station. My mum and I were carted off in the back of a Bedford van had holes on the floorboards of the Bedford van. I remember the fumes. It was tough. My mum was so shamed. They held us in the cells for until late that evening. They released us because it didn't look good that I'd been a minor in jail. Someone would come and collect us and take us back to, a, I think it was a halfway house. First time I had seen a, a room just for me and a bed. And I just, I remember thinking, well, this, this could be the home. I felt this would make my mum happy, but no, we just kept running. You couldn't 
befriend somebody for too long, you know, you sort of had to stay on your own and there was always a, a coaching from my mum not to, you know, not to talk too much about or get into trouble just in case the I got in trouble with the police and they and they'll find me or you know, they'll find the family and then they'll send us all back. The largest population of overstayers were from the United States, the UK and Australia. Pacific people formed about 30%, but we made up 90% of the arrest, convictions and deportations. We know that the police were ordered to pick on brown people. About a third of officers were either Pacific Islanders or Māori. And, uh, and this is the role we, we had to do. And I have no recollection of ever being involved in, in any entering or going to any houses where there were Europeans. Absolutely not. We hid with Māoris. It was easier. You could blend in with the Māoris. But if you try to hang out with the Pākehās, then you're going to stand out like a sore thumb and all the questions will come with it. If you're English here and you're an overstayer, you will blend in a lot better. But Islanders, we, we stand out. I had a house in Cromer Road, 83 Cromer Road, and number 60 Cromer Road was the Tongan Free Church. 60 people from there were taken one day, one morning, and they were all singing and hallelujahing and They took everybody who didn't have identification with them, and that included the minister, who was a, was a legitimate resident, uh, but, but didn't have his passport with him. They took 60 people and the minister down to Central, processed them, and not all of them were overstayers. They appeared in court the next day, head bowed in the clothes that they were in the night before, having a profound sense of shame at being arrested uh, and taken to prison. There was a big ocean liner called the Ocean Monarch that was in port. The Immigration Service arranged to have 15 of these church members deported on the Ocean Monarch. The Panthers, as well as Care and Natamatoa, went down to picket the boat uh, down at Princess Wharf. One of the crew came out and he was one of the jump ship. And he couldn't believe that Tongans and Samoans were going to be shipped across, yet he was an overstayer himself. And he said, if you can find me a place to stay for a few days, I'll go back in and try and persuade my, the crew. Ironically, an, an overstayer became our agent on board. I think it highlighted the fact that, you know, a Pākehā could disappear into the crowd and would never be seen. Miraculously, the captain advised the immigration service that they were not prepared to take these overstayers on board. Him and his crew protested and refused to sail. If we hadn't raised the alarm and, you know, protested about it, it would have just been swept under and these people would have just been arrested and then thrown out and that's it. For the government to tell the rest of the world that we're living harmoniously, nah, liars, bastards. You know, with the representations that we made and the outcry that took place, the dawn raids were stopped by Norman Kirk the next day. Stopping the dawn raids showed us we could win battles. And in 1974, the Panthers continued to fight for tenants' rights with Roger Fowler and the Ponsonby People's Union. In response, a group of landlords tried to form an association and held a conference on Queen Street where National Party leader Robert Muldoon was the guest speaker. He was a strong advocate for the landlords setting up this organisation and being more robust and, and defending what they saw as, as their rights as landlords. Bob Jones is a guest speaker and, and motivator, and um, Pat Rippon, who is also a big millionaire landlord. 
We, we had a, a, quite a large picket outside, probably several hundred people. Muldoon appeared and pushed his way through the crowd. Uh, you could tell easily that uh, he was, he'd already had a few too many gins. He actually stank of, of, of gin. They went ahead with their, their meeting and we went ahead with our picket. They failed to set up their association. So all these landlords left, obviously looking a bit grumpy. We were aware that Muldoon and Rippon and Bob Jones were still in the building. After about 10 minutes, Muldoon, Bob Jones and Pat Rippon came out and started laying into the, the crowd with fists, just lashing out, uh, including you know, young women and, and all sorts, and, and it was just general mayhem. Muldoon was the recipient of several flower bombs, which probably made him a little even more angry, and uh, again, lashing out uh, left, right and centre to, to uh, people, including uh, myself. And then we both ended up on the, on the road. The police moved in and grabbed him. I'll never forget him at the door of the limousine as he's, he's being manhandled into the back seat, yelling out, I'll take you on one at a time, I'll take you on one. In 1974, the Prime Minister, Norman Kirk, died suddenly while in office. The Honourable Mr Muldoon. The National Party Caucus places on record its profound sorrow at the death of the Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Norman Kirk. A year earlier, his government had prevented apartheid South Africa from sending the Springboks, angering rugby-mad Kiwis around the country. Frankly, I am confronted with the embarrassment of having said last year we would not stop the tour and the fact that now I must seek, on behalf of government, the postponement of the tour. Register your opinion on the Springbok tour. Good afternoon. I wholeheartedly disagree with Mr Kirk's decision. I disagree with uh, Kirk's decision. I thoroughly disagree with Mr Kirk and I don't think that he should poke his nose into something that just doesn't concern him. Now, Muldoon could campaign hard against an inexperienced Labour Party leader while appealing to those who felt New Zealand's way of life was under threat. The following is a party political broadcast on behalf of the National Party. Three years ago, you could play sport with anyone in the world and Labour promised to keep it that way. But they broke the promise. Now they decide for you. Last year, they decided... That when Norman Kirk died, Muldoon used that overstay issue as a law and order issue. He campaigned that he was going to set this country right, and this was how he was going to do it, and that was targeting Pacific Islanders because the stigma was that we were the violent and rapists and he's going to fix all these problems that these people are bringing in with them because they don't know us. Under national, immigration will be cut from 32,000 to around 5,000 people each year. A good environment also means maintaining law and order. We'll make certain that the police have the manpower to do the job and that their strength is reviewed continually. New Zealand, the way you want it. We're in God's own country, got to take the time. His 1975 election campaign had concentrated on a number of racial hotspots, if you like, and one of those was immigration, that Pacific Islanders with big afros were coming to take your jobs and beat you up. You are tinkering with the popular imagination that we were the people who needed law and order. Pacific people protect the, the community against us. And that now infamous Hanna-Barbera cartoon, which, you know, has caricatures of, of Pacific people in there. There was a time when New Zealand cities were quiet and clean. People said they were nice places to bring up children. But the cities grew alarmingly. People poured in, not just from the country, but from other countries as well. 62,000 in just two years. 
that was uh, you know, just a concerted campaign to scapegoat us for the woes of, of this country. In the previous couple of decades, there have been 600,000 people who had, had migrated to New Zealand from Europe, and really only a few thousand from the Pacific. But the whole emphasis was, was that Pacific migrants were putting all this pressure on them. And it was just pure and undiluted racism. Soon there were not enough schools or hospitals. Then one day, there weren't enough jobs either. The people became angry and violence broke out, especially among those who had come from other places expecting great things. Now I remember um, seeing the island uh, uh, um, getting chucked out of the pub, you know, that violent stuff, and that didn't sit right. And it was really a scare um, campaign. But, you know, if we don't get in, the communists are going to take over, the Polynesians are going to run wild with violence, and, uh, and it was terrible, you know, terrible for us. New Zealand cities are not such nice places to bring up children anymore. There was a conscious effort to focus fear on a minority group in order to get elected. We're in God's own country. Gotta take the time to take a look around. Muldoon, more than anyone else, intuitively recognised the huge brooding power of race. And whether it was through support for Springbok tours, dawn raids on Polynesian overstayers, or snipes at African leaders and Maori radicals, who built up a coalition of supporters, known commonly as Rob's Mob, appealing to those often blue collar Labour supporters who felt threatened. I was born in this country, I was brought up in this country. I know the ordinary bloke in this country, doesn't matter where he comes from or what he is. Rob Muldoon, leader of the National Party, just seen a monster swing at this election towards his party speaking. New Zealand is yours. With a new leader like Robert Muldoon, Pacific Islanders were in the crosshairs again. The dawn raids would return. The police used its task force and targeted Pacific Island meeting spots. We knew the fight had only just begun. But it wasn't enough for us to just fight an impressive system. We also had to win over our own people, our own parents. That battle would leave scars on both sides. In the next episode of Once a Panther... A panther and totally wipes out its aggressor, completely, wholly, absolutely. The army and the police would come marching up the hill. We all joined hands and just waited. This was starting to look like a military wing operation. We blew up a substation. Well, why don't we raid the ministers? Once a Panther is a stuff podcast written, produced, mixed and edited by Alex Liu and Brad Flayhive. Additional creative input by Stuff's podcast director, Adam Dudding. Original music by Andrew Faliatua. Executive produced by Carol Hirschfeld. If you want to know more, head to stuff.co.nz forward slash once a panther, where you'll find links to every episode, as well as photos, artwork and feature articles. You'll also find links for subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, and so on. If you're listening on Apple, don't forget to give Once a Panther a five-star rating and review. It helps other listeners find us. This episode included audio from the Marina McCartney film Milk and Honey, Getty, TVNZ, Archives New Zealand, and the Radio New Zealand collection at Natonga Sound and Vision. This podcast was made possible with help from New Zealand On Air. Hi, Michael Wright here. If you're enjoying this podcast, maybe you'd like to check out one of our others. Collapse is the story of the CTV building, which collapsed in the Christchurch earthquake in 2011, killing 115 people. We have a building on fire with persons trapped that we're trying to get out. It's the story of one tragedy in a city full of them. About how a building went up. It shouldn't have got through council. How it came down. 
And this level collapsed first. The people who were saved. She went from, I'm going to die, to a realisation, I'm going to live. And the 115 who weren't. This is a grown man in tears because they couldn't rescue these people. It's also a story about a search for the truth. Why did one unremarkable office building in the central city collapse like no other? How did almost two-thirds of Christchurch's entire earthquake death toll die in this one building? And most of all, was anyone responsible? Go to stuff.co.nz slash collapse or subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. If I don't get fire service here soon, they're going to die from the fire.